I think that's what we're all longing for. Could we find love, genuine love, genuine significance, even in a hopeless place? Whether you're skeptical and you're saying, hey, it's, it's not much hope that Christianity's true or any of the Bible's true or there's any genuine article, there's still a longing for significance, still a longing for purpose, a longing that my life be part of maybe a grander vision for my life. And I've often struck that many, many people, almost everyone I interact with, is interested in spiritual things while simultaneously turned off by spiritual people. I had a, a lunch... Uh, several months ago with a good friend of mine and he's turned off from church and he wanted to know if we go to lunch. We finished skiing together and we're sitting there having a conversation at lunch and it is one spiritual question after another and I wasn't bringing it up. I was avoiding the topic because I assumed you're talking to the pastor, you're talking about the Bible. So I'm not, I'm talking about skiing, I'm talking about trees, I'm talking about routes and he just won like a Pez dispenser, one spiritual question after another. We had this great discussion and the whole time he's asking these questions, he's also telling me why he hasn't been to church, he's not going to go to church, his family's not going to church because his new father-in-law is an absolute hypocrite. Just finger-wagging all the time, judgment, guilt, and everybody else while he's having an affair on his own wife. And just how it's turned him off to the entire message of the Bible. And yet he just kept asking questions. As you walk around Horizon, you're going to find lots of folks who love attending here who are not really convinced about the Bible being accurate or reliable or historical. People who, who may be like Jesus, but they're not really sure he's the son of God or that he rose himself from the grave. And yet when you hear their stories, as, as we've had many here on the stage, you're going to hear folks who attend our church who said, you know what, I once sold a high-end boat to a televangelist. And I got to hear him talk about how he was going to fleece the flock for, for another amount of money. And it was just so hypocritical. It just turned me off to see that up close. Someone to say, I was not a follower of Jesus, but my spouse was, and they cheated on me, and I'm supposedly the bad one? Spiritual people, interested in spiritual things, but turned off by spiritual people who don't practice what they preach. I think all of us have a story like that. A story in which we've been beat up by some religious person. Beat up maybe emotionally or by example. It was the priest that, you know, did horrific things to, to, to children. It was the pastor who ran off and had an affair. It was the, the, the father who had an anger problem but made sure we went to church. I think all of us have some story to tell about some way religious people beat us up or at least beat up the message they supposedly represented. And today we're going to learn about how to navigate that. And I want to propose to you that when people do something to you, God can create a moment to do something in you. When people do something to you, and we all have a story, right? You've told that story about whoever did that thing to you that you can't forgive, that you didn't like. You've told it many, many times. And it really hasn't gotten you anywhere except more angry and more resentful. But what if when somebody does something to you, it's a chance instead to see what God wants to do in you? As Pete shared, he had lots of examples of bad, hypocritical, Amway Christians, but he really began to say... Am I a hypocrite? Do I need forgiveness? Do I need a higher purpose? Despite my doubts, is there a journey I might need to go on? Is there something I need to wrestle through? Something I need to doubt about myself, about my journey, about my conclusions? So my encouragement to you today is give yourself and spirituality the benefit of the doubt. Enough to say, despite what people have done to you, and I don't doubt it's a horrible story. And I don't doubt if you shared it, we wouldn't all, you know, get angry on your behalf, maybe a little weepy on your behalf. But don't let what others have done to you keep you from finding the moment of what God might want to do in you through this journey. And we learned last week about a man named Jeremiah who had a lot of doubts. And God asked him to come and speak to his nation, a nation of hypocrites who claimed to follow God and were not in any way living it out. Not for a week, not for a day, but now it's been centuries. And so Jeremiah is going to have the snot beat out of him by these religious people. He is doing God's will, God's way, and the response he gets is utter rejection and pain all around. And he is going to need the rope of hope. He is going to need the rope of hope because he's going to find himself yet again in the dungeon of doubt. And this time it is a deep, deep dungeon that's caused... Not by his intellectual beliefs, but by what other people do. 
And God is going to tell him that he's supposed to come to this nation of religious people who have not been practicing what they preach, and he's supposed to tell them that their hypocrisy has come to the end of the rope. And there's three ways in which we see their hypocrisy at the end of the rope. And the first one is they reject truth. Now, is it true that if you have some story to tell, it's probably where somebody rejected truth. You brought them feedback and they rejected it. They thought they were a know-it-all and they were religious. They thought they were a know-it-all and they weren't religious. But they weren't humble. They weren't teachable. They weren't open. Well, that's exactly what happens. Jeremiah comes and tells them that they need to abandon the city. The nation of Babylon is coming. And God says, they're coming, and they're coming to conquer you. And I'm going to let them conquer you, because for several hundred years, you have been doing horrific things. So, Babylon's going to conquer you, and I want you, Jeremiah, to tell people, this is kind of, you know, reap what you sow time, consequence time. And they are to not try and protect the city, surrender to Nebuchadnezzar, and they will live. As we mentioned last week, this was historically true. When Nebuchadnezzar came in and spread, if people would surrender to him and become a slave state, they would live. They had to pay a huge tax to him, but they would live. If they resisted at all, he was brutal. Meat hooks into your back, dragging you and your family across the countryside. So history's confirmed that what God tells Jeremiah to tell the people is exactly what would have saved their life. But do you think the people accept the truth? Of course not. In fact, here's what happens. Thus says the Lord, he who remains in the city shall die by the sword, by famine and pestilence. But if you go over to the Chaldeans, also known as uh, the Babylonians, you will live. Your life will be a prize to him and he will surely live. So if you want to live, trust me. You've never, you haven't trusted me very well before. You haven't obeyed me, before. obey me now and you'll save your life. But the people reject the truth. Remember, we had Phil Vischer up here about a year ago. He was the CEO of VeggieTales. Well, I remember a friend of mine here at our church went up to help him when they were declaring bankruptcy. And he was struck that their company, in trying to be you know, as big as Disney, bankrupt themselves by making bad decision after bad decision. And Phil Vischer shared that as a Christian, it all became about him and his name, what he wanted, and he didn't hear the advice of people saying, you're spending too much, this business model isn't going to work, that's not going to save the day. That feels a good guy, but he admitted he was rejecting the truth around him and he bankrupt the number one children's uh, DVD and video business in the country at the time. I think we've all got stories of people that we were turned off by because they just rejected truth. Well, the second thing is these, again, religious people living in Jerusalem. They got a temple. They got lots of fancy things and, and they do lots of fancy ritual. But But these same people are treating him so badly that now they begin to question his motives. And like daggers into his heart or arrows out of their quiver, they're just shooting him up and saying, oh, you're not doing this to save us. You're not doing this to be helpful. They're questioning your motives, questioning what you're doing. And man, haven't you been there? Will you try and say something as nicely as you can, as kindly as you can, as gently as you can? And what you get in return are people questioning your motives. This isn't about me, it's about you. And you get on the stinging end of hypocrisy when people question everything you do. Remember I had my first job. I was a youth pastor. I was 21 down in Atlanta. I'd been there about six months. And this one girl in the student ministry, for whatever reason, didn't like me. So I got a call in to talk to her parents, who also were elders at the church. And they pulled out a notebook. Chad, we'd like to talk about a few things. Great, what's going on? Page after page after page after page of everything I'd done wrong. I'm like, I didn't even know I'd done that much stuff right or wrong. Like, wow, like, wow. And I'm just questioning my motives, questioning my call to ministry, questioning my, my attitude. Like, and I'm like, I want to learn here. Well, can I explain what happened? That's, I, I don't even know what that is. It was devastating. I just felt so hurt. That I wasn't given the benefit of doubt at all. My motives were questioned. And that's exactly what happens here with Jeremiah. So these religious people who are questioning him doing what God told him to do. And here's what they say. This man, please let this man. They're talking to the king. These are the princes talking to the king about Jeremiah. Please let this man be put to death. For thus he weakens the hands of the men of war who remain in the city and the hands of all the people. By speaking such words to them. 
For this man does not seek the welfare of the people, but their harm. Now, you got to appreciate their dilemma. They're trying to recruit people to the war effort. And the main prophet, the Billy Graham of the day, is saying, we're going to lose, we're going to lose, we're going to lose. Right? This is not good for recruitment. So you can appreciate their dilemma. But they, no, no, he's not trying, he's saying, no, this is how we save life, this is how we save life, this is how we save life. They're like, no, this is how you, 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 you get rid of patriotism, this is how you don't have a good uh, war effort. But he just has all of his motives questioned. In fact, there's another book Jeremiah wrote called the Book of Lamentations. It's right after the Book of Jeremiah in your Bible. And it's a collection of his doubts. It's literally him just struggling through why God's letting this happen. Why God lets people do things to him and to the people he loves. And it's just one paragraph after paragraph of just ruthless, raw doubting. And God left it in the Bible. And here's one just gives you a feel for how he feels about how he's being questioned. He has pierced the arrows of his quiver. Sorry, he has caused the arrows of his quiver to pierce my loins. I have become the ridicule of all people. Their taunting song all the day. He, he's talking about God. God has filled me with bitterness and he has made me drink wormwood. Now this is a prophet of God. And yet he feels open to talk with that level of raw emotion with God about his doubts and struggles. God, these religious people I'm supposed to lead, they reject truth, they question my motives, and then it gets worse. These religious people actually have hurtful actions. And it's pretty devastating what they do. They actually take Jeremiah and they drop him into what's called a dungeon. And here they're going to leave him. Now, in order to do that, they had to lower him down on a rope. So apparently there was some, you know, nice long rope, because you'll see how deep this, this uh, well is in a second. They lowered Jeremiah down into the dungeon, and here's what the Bible says happened to him. Again, keep in mind, these are religious people who have done this to this guy. So they took Jeremiah and cast him into a dungeon of Micaiah, the king's son, which was in the court of the prison. And they let Jeremiah down with ropes, and in the dungeon there was no water but mire. And Jeremiah sank in the mire. So water has long gone, it is filled with mud. And he is up to his neck in mud. Now I don't know if you've ever been hiking or hunting and got your boots caught in the mud. We had an old cornfield behind our house and it's just like, oh my God, you pull, pull, or we jet ski down the river all the time. Many of my shoes are in the river somewhere two feet into the mud. And you pulled out, and the boot stuck there just because of the suction. Now imagine that level of pressure, that level of suction all the way up to your chest. You're gasping for every breath. The mud, the disease, the cold, you're not eating, and they've abandoned him down here. These are the king's son and the princess of the country, in God's name, have done this to him. I have a good friend of mine who went through sexual abuse. And what she would describe is that she went on a mission trip. And on a mission trip, as a single person, there was a Christian leader who was married and a Christian man. And that Christian man, who was a Christian leader on a Christian trip, took advantage of her. And for years, the doubt, the questioning of God, the shame, that it filled them with. Because some spiritual person dropped them into a dungeon of doubt. And many of us have found ourselves in a metaphorical dungeon of doubt, not knowing how to get out, because then they pull the rope up. And they leave Jeremiah there to die, to starve, to suffocate. Have you spent any time in the dungeon of doubt? Maybe it's the dungeon of doubting what other people have done. Doubting if God really helps. Doubting if you're ever going to get out of depression. Doubt if you're ever going to get out of this medical situation you're in. My wife and I are spending some time in this dungeon. She had surgery eight weeks ago and it doesn't seem like it's working. And just the, the hopelessness of the situation, the discouragement of the situation. We're going in for more imaging. We're going in for another doctor's appointment. And it's like two and a half years of just constant pain all the time. You feel like you're in the dungeon of doubt and there's no way out. Just pressure pushing on you. So what do you do if you're Jeremiah and you're in the dungeon of doubt? I want to recommend two things. The first thing is I want you to look for the rope of hope in the crowd. Because many of us, when we look up, we say, who put me here in this dungeon? How did I get here? 
and we have got a crowd of people we can speak to. It was my boss, it was my mom, it was my neighbor, it was my friend, it was the pastor. We got some list of people that were on the end of that rope that put us into that dungeon. And I want to propose to you that you're really good at telling that story. But I want you to try just for today, just for a moment, to look for in that crowd of people who dropped you into that dungeon. I want you to try and look in the crowd of hypocrites for someone who stands out differently. In the midst of all the hypocrites, and there's plenty, have you ever come across someone who is genuine, who admitted that they weren't perfect, who was a person of faith? Of all the people who didn't do it right, were there a few people who there's something about their life was attractive and genuine and real? I want you to play a little Where's Waldo, right? If you look real carefully, they're not all angry. Right in the middle is Waldo. And I bet you if you look carefully, you would find that in your life, there's been an example of a father, a son, a coach, a colleague, that though most people were hypocrites, you couldn't caricature all of them. There was someone who genuinely cared, someone who genuinely was trying to live out this life of forgiveness, this life of spirituality. And part of overcoming and even starting the process of of being open to faith, open to the fact that it even might be true, is to look past all the dungeon. And while you're in the dungeon, all the crowd of hypocrites and say, you know what, I want to focus on the one person who didn't put me here and say, what did they have, what did she have that maybe I need in my life? How do we look in the crowd of hypocrites for the rope of hope? Jeremiah, again, writing in his journal entry in the book of Jeremiah, says something pretty powerful, which is the second thing you can do if you're in this, in this dungeon, is to realize the rope of hope is not people in any way. People are always going to let you down. Even the best of people are not going to be able to not at some point be a hypocrite or at some point not be able to meet your expectations. So the second thing you can do if in your dungeon of doubt is look for people who do live out what they say But two, realize that the rope of hope is that you've been clinging to God. You're not clinging to people. See, that's the difference. Hope doesn't come from people. They can be a source of it. But ultimately, your real source of hope is God. And to say, God, while I'm in this dungeon, I hope I can feel loved and comforted and cared for by other people. But the real hope of hope, of the rope of hope, is I am clinging to you. And look what Jeremiah says. Just as he's in the middle of this big speech about how God's hated me and God's been shooting me up uh, with arrows, he says, but my soul remembers and sinks within me, and this I recall to mind. This is what he recalls to mind, and therefore I have hope. Okay, what does he do? What does Jeremiah do? What does he recall to his mind to have hope? The Lord's mercies... And through his mercy we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, and therefore I hope in him. Now, if you grew up in church, you may recognize that line, great is thy faithfulness. That line came directly out of Jeremiah's doubting book. He said, I need to realize that most people were not faithful. Most people was not what I was clinging to. But I recalled to mind and therefore had hope that great is his faithfulness. God can be the rope of hope in my dungeon of doubt. He's who I'm clinging to. He's who I'm trusting in. He's going to be the source to get me out of here and to sustain me while I'm in here. God wants to be your rope of hope if you're in a Jeremiah stage of your life where you find yourself in some kind of dungeon of doubt. And God wants you to look for the people who maybe stand out as different. It was interesting, the conversation I had with my friend. He said, Chad, i got to tell you, I'm really against religious people, but i got to tell you, I really enjoy our talks. You're like one of the top ten most interesting people I've ever met. I was at another church, and we had a guy who was kind of skeptical about his faith. And he said, you know what, the amazing thing about coming to church here for the last three months is everyone here has a great personality. And I'm like, no, we don't. But what he was observing was that there was something distinct about the kind of people who live out grace 
not self-righteousness. They're willing to admit when they make mistakes. There was something attractive. He was beginning to see there's something different from the caricature of the televangelist I've come across. So if you're Jeremiah, look for the rope of hope in the crowd of hypocrites. And two, realize you're clinging to God, not to people for your hope. But there's two characters in our story. Our second character is a very unnamed, untalked about hero of the Bible. And his name is Abin Malik. Abin Malik, an Ethiopian eunuch. And Abin Malik, rather than needing the rope of hope, Abin Malik is going to be the rope of hope. See, he's working in the king's palace. He's heard what the princes have done to Jeremiah. He has prestige, he has power, he has reputation. And yet he is going to risk his reputation for the sake of others. He's going to risk his reputation at great cost to himself. He may end up in the the dungeon of doubt, but he can't do nothing. He wants to be the one to be the source of hope to someone who's in the dungeon of doubt. And that may be you. God may be calling you to be an Eben Malik in your, someone's life. That someone is caught in the dungeon of depression and God wants you to be the source of life and hope and encouragement to them. Look what it says in the passage. Just as Jeremiah gets lowered down and apparently they take the rope up because the rope's going to be gone in a second. Now Ebed Malik, the Ethiopian, one of the eunuchs who was in the king's house, heard that they had put Jeremiah in the dungeon. And when the king was sitting in the, the gate of Benjamin, Eben Malik went to the king's house. He's about to say, your son did this. Your princes did this. I mean, the stakes are high here. My lord, the king, these men, including your son, have done evil in all that they have done to Jeremiah the prophet, whom they have cast into the dungeon. He is likely to die from hunger in the place where he is. For there is no more bread in the city. And the king commanded Ebed Malik, the Ethiopian, saying, All right, we'll take 30 men with you and lift Jeremiah the prophet out of the dungeon before he dies. A couple things I want you to notice. If you want to be the rope of hope for people, it's going to take risks. He risked his reputation. He risked his popularity. If you're going to help people who are in hurting places and, and dark places and doubting places, it is not pretty. The idea of it's very glorious, but you get in there and try and help people who are stuck in the dungeon of doubt, and it is not glorious at all. It's painful, often ungrateful, but it's because they're stuck up to their neck in mud. In the same way, trying to pull your leg out of that, cor- out of that mud in the cornfield or when you're out hunting, imagine the suction going on here. How much power is it going to take? How much strength is it going to take to pull this guy out of here? Thirty men. Whoa, whoa, think about that for a second. There's not just one where's Waldo here. Evan Malik, who's willing to help. 30 more people were not the hypocrites that rejected truth. There were 30 more people who weren't questioning his motives. There's 30 more people who weren't the ones who dropped him in the dungeon. So part of looking for the rope of hope in the crowd of hypocrites is realizing there may be more real, genuine people out there than you're open to or that you're seeing right now. And Eben Malik finds a problem. And the problem is the princes took the rope of hope away. That rope, which apparently was very, very long and very, very new and very, very, you know, went the right length, they've taken it away. So Evan malik has got to, number one, risk his reputation for the sake of others. But number two, he's got to find the resources around him to figure out how to help him. So he recruits 30 people. And then, <laughs> let me show you what he does. So Evan malik took the men with him and went to the house of the king under the treasury. And he took from there old clothes and old rags and let them down by ropes. Apparently they had to get lots of different old ropes, tie them together with these rags in order to get Jeremiah from the dungeon. He looks for rags. He looks for ropes. He uses whatever he has. And he creates a rope of hope out of what resources he has and lowers it down to Jeremiah. He tells Jeremiah to put the rags under his arms because the amount of yank and pull that's going to happen is going to be pretty horrific. So with the rags under his arms and these old ropes tied together, he and 30 men begin to yank and 
pull and pull and slowly but surely yank Jeremiah out of the dungeon of doubt using the resources they had. Now I would propose to you that that is the mission that God has called us as a church to do. A personal mission and significance God wants you to do in your life is if you're in the dungeon of doubt, God would encourage you to look for your Evan Malik. Realize that God may be your source, not the hypocritical people. But more importantly, the significance God may be calling you to this morning is He wants you to be Evan Malik. That you could be the, the indirect source of His hope to someone. Because you can be the one lowering with whatever you have. You got hospitality gifts, you're cooking meals. You got an encouragement gift, you're encouraging people who, who need some encouragement. You have the ability to just love people. You have certain talents and skills. What our church is about is trying to help people, whatever dungeon they're in, find hope. And you're going to find all around our church stories of that. Folks whose family went through challenges and didn't have the kind of psychological treatment here in Cincinnati that was available. So they started their own psychological treatment that would bless them and bless all of us in the city. You're going to find folks in our church who have, who have not rags. They have surgical skills and they love being a surgeon. But they said, what if I took that and I brought it to Belize and, and we gave away $2 million worth of free surgeries to people in Belize who could never afford it. And so their rags don't even look like rags. They actually look like taking whatever they have, their surgical gifts. You're going to hear stories of folks who are administrators in hospitals who went down to Belize and, and found a, a, girls who just for a couple hundred bucks a year don't have to go into prostitution but rather could get an education change jobs and they sort of financially adopted many of them encourage other people to do the same and and so for just a couple thousand dollars a year all of a sudden girls who didn't even know there was another way out of their dungeon of doubt could suddenly be liberated you're going to find folks like charlie who's grieving the loss of his wife and charlie said i'm just consumed with grief what can i do and he says i think i want to go and i want to cook meals for those at city gospel and he's cooked over 100,000 meals. And every time we've tried to thank him as a church, he said, don't thank me. God used this process of me using my cooking skills to help other people, to pull me out of the dungeon in doubt because I got my mind off myself and my grief and God became my hope and God became my strength and God became my, my source. Just two weeks ago, I was talking about this video project that we're involved in, and we're putting you know, video in place, and we're remodeling several different rooms in the building so that we can create tools to help people. And somebody said, Chad, we want to be part of that. And they sat down and said, you know, our, our rag stories, we want to make a gift. We've had folks in the last couple of months making three-figure gifts, four-figure gifts. This was a, a five-figure gift, saying, hey, we want to be part of this. We want to have other people experience what we've experienced attending here. We want to give to our operational fund. We want to give to the, to the future growth fund so that there's new tools for people. They can be pulled out of whatever spiritual depths they're in, whatever questions they have. That's what we're about as a church. So wherever you are in your journey, we want to be an encouragement to you. We want to be a source of hope to you. And we want you to be a source of hope to others. Use your gifts. Use your passions. Use your talents, use your rags, use your old ropes to be a source of hope to those around you. And that's what the main message of the Bible is because Jesus will ultimately talk about Jeremiah and his prophecies often. And Jeremiah is kind of an example of Jesus. For he will come to his people and they will reject him in the same city. They will question his motives. And they will throw him not into a pit, but they'll throw him onto a cross. And when it looks like there is no hope he's going to die, it looks like there's no way he's out of there, he even cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Yet the story of Jesus is a God that doesn't forsake us. For even when he felt forsaken and articulate his doubt, he's then able to look up and say, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. It is finished. Because Jesus went into the dungeon of doubt for you and I. So we could have the rope of hope that death is not the final chapter. And whatever season you're in, whatever difficulty you're in, it may feel like a crucifixion. But God can even bring life out of crucifixion. God can even bring purpose out of its seemingly purposelessness. So number one, if you're Jeremiah today and you feel like you're there for some reason, look for the rope of hope in the crowd of hypocrites. Two, 
Remember, God is, and God wants to be your source of hope, not people. And two, maybe you need to think about of all the things you've been entrusted with, all the talents you have, all the skills you have, all the opportunities you have, all the relational networks you have, what might God want you to do to be the rope of hope for people in your family, in your neighborhood, or in your country? Let's be people known as people of hope. And if I can, you know, let's do that. Last week, we all get here real early. Because we get here real early, we hadn't heard the news about the tragedies that had occurred last year, or last weekend, with all the different shootings. We didn't get a chance to pray for that last week because, honestly, most of us had been here and hadn't read the news. But if ever there's a time that our country has needed hope, it's now. And I don't know what that might look like for you. But what does it look like for you to be a source of hope to the people who are hurting in our nation even now? So we pray together for that and ask that God may call us as a church to be those kind of hope-giving people. Let's pray. Father, a lot of people here in this room feel like they're in a dungeon. For some, it's a small dungeon. For them, it's a long, long long-time dungeon. It seems like there's no way out. But Father, we thank you that you're a God of hope. And Father, would you give us the freedom to doubt and scribble and write and be angry like the book of Lamentations allowed? Yet also show us that in the middle of all that darkness is the glimmer of truth, that we can recall this to mind and therefore have hope that your mercies are new every morning, new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. And Father, in your hope and faithfulness, you draw near to those who've lost children and lost friends, those in our country who are grieving this week because of their loss of life. Will you restrain evil that seems to be running amok? Will you raise up good people to stand against evil? And Father, will you draw near to all those who are mourning? For you say that you're an ever-ready help in tight places. And you tell us that you are the great comforter. And blessed are those who mourn. For when we mourn, we can be comforted. And through all that, Father, we ask that you would draw near to us as a people. And show us how we can be the rope of hope to whoever around us is in those dungeons of doubt. In Jesus' name, amen.